So I think I will try to do the rest in English, but since it is post lunchtime and I hope you managed to grab something nice to eat, I will try to talk about something uh, less serious and more fun. So, uh, you might have seen me previously at this conference a couple of years ago, and uh, there are some facts that remain constant, such as I'm still not wearing a suit, and uh, I still like to uh, do some reversing, analyzing malware and look at, looking at it, and chasing the bad guys behind it. If I speak too fast, too bad, I have too many slides. So, let's see what we have there. Quick introduction, you have seen that one. What we have out there is... I'm talking about ransomware and everybody was asking, isn't this old news? Like, you have been talking about it previously. I actually was. This was something that was ransomware when I was here the first time, I think three years ago. It was showing you some message that you should pay us money because we are the police and if you don't pay, we will go after you. Great. It worked. And the bad news is, it actually still works. Not necessarily this one, this one is old one, but it still works. This kind of something simple, social engineering without any sophistication, just nice graphics. Nice graphics which tells you you are in trouble. And it works. Perhaps we should move a bit into the history. I'm talking about year 75 BC, not of this calendar, but 75 before Christ. Before Christ. Uh, there was this gentleman who you might recognize as Mr. Caesar, Gaius Julius Caesar. He was not the emperor at the time, but he was still a very important person who got captured by pirates. We are talking about the guys who are having boats, not who are downloading from torrents. And uh, these guys demanded ransom for returning his back, him back. They said something about, we want 20 talents of silver. And he told them, no, I'm worth more. You should pay more. So, he sent some requests, the money, the, the, the silver was collected, delivered, then they released him, he got back and actually built a small army, returned back and, hang, and uh, had all those pirates hanged. Since then, he uttered a very famous phrase at the time, which was, Gaius doesn't pay ransom, or as we abbreviate it these days, it is GDPR. Now, this was uh, quite some time ago. It is not that interesting, really. So perhaps we should move to current day. For example, thinking what we can learn from the past, not the distant past. Yes, of course, if you happen to be able to build an army, you can go, to, go after the kidnappers and have them hanged. But that's not the right approach. What we can do is look at 2014, when the first thing that was actually ransomish in nature in the modern days was appearing. Ransomish in the sense that it was doing the file encryption thingy. It took files, encrypted them. Good news was it was encrypting them in the wrong way, which allowed it to be decrypted without paying ransom, but it was a fully fledged ransomware. It was not the only one, of course, since it turned out to be, well, working. People started doing some new things. Sometimes they just told you that your computer is blocked and if you don't follow the instructions and pay, everything will be removed. Everything, including the BIOS uh, operating system, everything. The reality, of course, was nothing would be happening. But people were scared enough and paid. Move to 2013, the Mac users were, com were complaining that they have lack of the ransomware for their platform, so no worries. People did the implementation of ransomware in browser. It didn't do anything. It was just showing you a page telling you that your browser is now locked and, or your computer is now locked. And the very important bit was, actually you couldn't close this page very easily. So if you close the full browser and you opened it again, it actually opened the last visited page, which was this one, which meant your browser literally was not working. So the people did feel like, okay, my computer, the only useful feature on it called the browser is not working. So some of them paid, it worked. It can be also done with Android. There are quite a few pages that you can visit and they tell you your device might be infected. Please click here and buy our wonderful program for removing it. It is usually called something like antivirus name dot uh, random, 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 very weird domain. And if you, close, if you try to close it, it tells you, you should not be closing me because you will be in big trouble. If you try to close it, the same will repeat, repeat, repeat. After roughly 250 times, it will go away, except very few people have such a patience. But still, this was just annoying. Perhaps we can look at devices like Android, but not in just the warning kind. This is NSA after you, after all these guys know what they are doing. And uh, this one was encrypting files on a mobile. 
Not a surprising thing, after all, there are things that we have in mobiles that we don't have anywhere else. Most of the pictures I take these days are actually taken by the mobile. I do have a very nice DSLR. I can take very nice pictures, except when you are trying to take pictures of your kids. You can't really wait to pull out the camera because the, what they are doing is not going to repeat. And that's precisely the kind of pictures, kind of files, that are created once and cannot be recreated later. Just like you cannot retake the pictures of your wedding that was taking place two years ago, you can't really do the same with any of the many things that just happened once. The first steps of your kit are only going to happen once, not many times. And if the mobile is the only place where they are, they might be very good to use as a kidnappable object. It can be encrypted and then the, the ransom can be demanded. Thanks to all the cloud services and so on, we do not see it that often. Fortunately, with these guys, they, they actually made another mistake. They encrypted it in so poor way that, again, it could be decrypted without paying the ransom. After they figured out that it can be done without anybody paying them, they improved. It was still bad. Then they improved. It was still bad. And then they improved for the fourth time and it was not bad anymore, unfortunately. So, yeah, they learn. They learn and try to new tricks. New tricks are usually working. What else do we have here? Oh, this is for those who are lazy. You don't need to do any programming yourself. You don't even need to go to a like high school university or university or uh, like targeting computer scientists or programmers or engineers. You can just buy it as a service. You configure all the details like you, so you can say, okay, this is the ransom amount to be requested. This is the amount of time you should give to the victim. This is the payment address. And this is what should happen afterwards. This is a service. We have the infrastructure as a service, software as a service, this as a service. Now we have ransom as a service. You, don't, you, can, you can actually choose your best provider of this service. Some of them might be providing better prices or some bundle packages like here, have a banking trojan next, uh, along with the ransomware or so. Fortunately, that's not happening yet, but one never knows. But that's another evolutionary step in the area of like how to make business out of taking ransom without actually using it, because these guys are not using their own creation. They are only reselling it for someone else to use. Therefore, are they liable for any kind of like committing any kind of crime? It is getting to the more interesting areas like of the law and in what jurisdiction and how it works wherever. Now, 2016 also saw another thing called Petya. This is a scary screen, it is red, and uh, well, Windows, usual, Windows users like the blue screen, this is a red screen, but it is equally bad. Blue screen usually means that you can restart and it works again. This red, red screen means a lot of stuff has been encrypted, and those who are behind it were actually making a quite nice advertisement for it. It was called Petya, that was one of the encryption parts. It was accompanied by another encryption <coughs> bit called Misha. If one of them couldn't work, the other one could help. It was quite well known, and fortunately, again, someone trying something new meant they screwed up. It was something that could be broken. It wasn't as easily broken as with the others, but it took some time to understand how it can be broken. But it could, which is good. But again, once you release information that this encryption can be broken because it is poorly done, the next step, the expected next step is it will no longer be breakable because the next var var variant will improve. And it did. Now, one of the funnier things from 2016 was actually trying to bring everybody into the area of uh, like friendship and uh, put everything into test. Because one of the ways for paying ransom was you can pay, you can pay two bitcoins. Don't worry, that was, oh, sorry, one bitcoin. You can pay one bitcoin. It is not the current price. It was in 2016, so don't worry. You don't need to pay the whatever 4,000 USD or whatever the exchange rate is these days. It was considerably less back then. Or you can do it slightly differently. You can actually infect your two friends, and if they pay, you will get your decryption for free. Now, this is an interesting twist, I have to say. Interesting for everybody but the victims, of course. And I do wonder how it would reflect on the relations between people if you really try to infect your friends in order to get your files back and how happy they would be about it. Another thing that was actually appearing in this year, earlier this year, was called ransomware. It is not really ransomware, or rather it is. It claims that you can't do anything unless you win certain score in the game. 
Fortunately, we are talking about funny thing, which was not doing any kind of encryption in the background, so it was really fun rather than actual badness. But one never knows. There are various methods of payment. You can pay in cash, you can pay via transfer, you can pay in cryptocurrencies. Perhaps one of the forms of payment is you need to click, you need to click 20,000 times on some like this button or something, of the, or something different which makes these payments very, very untraceable, very intangible. It is not clear who is the one profiting from this kind of activity. So the link between the actual bad software and the one who is behind it can be very unobvious. Now, I was mentioning the, the fir with the first screen that the ransomware, I was talking about it three years ago and it was not new then. How comes it is still working? Why do people still get infected? Well, because people still fall for this kind of emails. Ho, 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 it is Christmas. Well, it's not Christmas right now. This one is from uh, last year from the Christmas time. And Mr. Klaus was sending something via Christmas elves mailing system. It actually was accompanied by a nice picture. Uh, the good news is that this one was not spreading ransomware. The bad news is that this one was spreading something much worse, an SPNR software targeting some high profile targets and people were falling for this one. So if HAL profile target actually clicks on this one, why would you expect a normal person not to click on anything that vaguely remembers an email with a link or something that you can open? An attachment that can be opened will be opened. A link that can be clicked will be clicked. That's what just is a fact at the moment. People are clicking and falling for tricks that I have been showing three years ago, tricks that were known for 10 years, they still work because it's the human doing it rather than the computer. There is no need for security vulnerability. The human nature is still good enough as a target to work well enough. Now, one of the things that was uh, gained some fame earlier this year called WannaCryptor or WannaCrypt or WannaCry or Wanna many other things. It was technically speaking not that interesting. It was a properly written piece of ransomware. So. What makes it interesting is not how it worked, whether it worked, but rather how it spread. What makes it interesting was the fact that it was spread using a security vulnerability, which is attributed to the NSA, but what is important, it was leaked at one point this year. On the 14th of March, the patch was released. One month later, the exploit itself was released, so it was not a zero day at the time when it was released. It was a 30-day thing already, in the sense it was patched for 30 days already. We added detection sometime afterwards, shortly afterwards, and it took another month before WannaCry started spreading, or WannaCryptor. And it was successful. It hit the news everywhere. Something that was patched two months ago. Yes, we could say that not all the systems were patched because you know Windows XP didn't get the patch at the time. It was actually later when Microsoft decided that due to the fact that this thing is spreading, it might be a good idea to actually patch even the unsupported systems, which they did, and this is a very good thing to do. But it was not these systems that were the only infected ones. It was the very fresh ones that were not updated for some reasons. And in many cases, it was not the individual users, but rather companies being hit. The reason being very simple. It is not that because the users would be like taking more care about their computers, that could be a factor as well. But there is, one, there is a lot more interesting factor in it, which is the home users are usually not directly accessible from the internet. Many of the ISPs do have various kinds of network address translations. Basically, they don't have enough IP addresses to give out to people, so they aggregate them behind an IP address, behind a single address when going out, which means the single devices behind are not accessible directly from the internet. And this is what was being used here. This is a vulnerability that actually allowed you to attack a machine connected to the internet that was accessible and had some specific service exposed. But the home users were actually in a much better position because many of them were possibly vulnerable but not accessible. Unlike that, many of the companies do have some server that is exposed and when you get a foothold in the server and you don't have proper network segmentation, you might end up with one single machine starting to attack everything else. And the spreading will 
grow out of proportions. There were very big organizations hit by this one, and unfortunately, the encryption worked reasonably well. But that's not the only thing. Again, this year, we saw something that is related to ransomware, but it's actually like surprising that someone would be wasting the potential of this. Case in Ukraine. Ukrainians were using a software developed by a company called MEDOC. We have a blog post about this published on our website. But what is interesting there, this software, someone managed to con get hold of the software vendor of the one that, were, that was making this software, got hold of their infrastructure and started pushing out updates which contained malicious component. In one case, it was in March and it was distributing ransomware. In May, it was distributing ransomware. In June, it was distributing, well, you can guess, yeah, ransomware. Uh, or maybe it was not really, really ransomware. The first two were, were proper ransomware-ish things. You, they encrypt your files, claim that they want some money, and that's about it. The last one, I'm calling it Petya here, because it was showing very big similarity to the Petya I mentioned. But after that, it got some other names, such as not Petya, or ex Petya, or ex Petya, or whatever other names, because it looked like it, it encrypted like it, like it, but it didn't share one important property with it. With Petya, if you paid the ransom, the bad guy could send you a piece of information, like a key, that you could type in to get your files or disk decrypted. With this one, they wouldn't be able to do that because, yes, there was a prompt for the key, but it would not accept the key that was necessary for decrypting. It would not accept properly formed key that was necessary for decryption. Yes, it is possible someone made a mistake, like really is the half finished piece of malware. That's not a surprise. It is possible. Why well, not? People are not perfect anyway. But it is something that is actually very relevant, because if you think of it, it can be used not for the ransom purposes, it can be used as a false flag operation. If you start investigating it, you will say, okay, everybody got hit by Petya, so yeah, it is a known ransomware, nothing spectacular about it, except it might be not. Something else might be happening at the same time, but also it might be a lot more targeted. Due to the way it was targeting the computers, they were how it was distributed, it was not sent out via email to everybody. It was not using the WannaCryptor kind of vulnerability that can be used for attacking everybody. It was distributed via software that is only used by a very small, relatively speaking, number of people. All of them are located within one particular country. As it turns out, this ransomware actually spread a bit further, or ransomware, whether it is one or I, I'm not sure, but it spread out a bit further thanks to the fact that some of the networks of different organizations are interconnected. So while it was using the Eternal Blue vulnerability, the same one as WannaCryptor, it was not using it for spreading over the internet, but only for spreading locally within the local network. So its intention was not to leave the network that it got in, and the entry mechanism was the one with infected software. Infected software that you had been using for years. It is a trusted piece of software. People were using it. So why not? Why not install ransomware in it? But you could also use it for much worse purposes. You could steal data for ages because this was an accounting or tax filing software. Actually, there were some creative minds who decided that, ah, actually, since every, all of these companies got their data encrypted, perhaps, if I want some uh, like extension for filing my taxes, I should run the ransomware on my own computer and then say, I was a victim, I was a victim, I can't file the taxes yet because everything in my computer was encrypted. Interesting, whether it works, I don't know, but it's an idea that sprang into some creative person's mind. Actually, he got arrested, I think. Now, there is something that was displayed. Funny picture, they some of the ransomware is nice. It just encrypts your files and gives you a message. Those of you who are, who are watching the uh, Mr. Robot uh, series might be recognizing the F Society. And it was in Ukraine. Ukraine is the country which got hit by many different things, including ransomware waves, but also by things that actually turned off part of the electrical infrastructure. So perhaps there was something more behind it than just the demands for ransom, in particular if we know 
that if, even if you paid the ransom, you wouldn't be getting the files back, at least directly. Now, something that is much newer, if you had been following the news, you might have heard that CCleaner, which is also a quite popular utility, practically speaking, I think it is more popular than uh, the MEDoc software, was also under the control of some bad guys. They were using it for spreading or including a piece of code that actually did contact some CNC server and allowed it to give, or to give commands to the actual infected machines. But what if someone decided, this is a popular software people are using, let's put a ransomware in it. Not a stupid ransomware that acts immediately after it infects the machine, but a smart one. You get your fully fledged C cleaner, it is running, everything is working correctly, and then let's say two weeks later, after everybody has downloaded the latest and greatest version, it will start encrypting the files all around. Perhaps it could be one of the biggest waves of successful ransomware that we have seen. This is another kind of supply chain attack in the sense that in this case it's not a supplier as a business to business kind of environment. It is rather a person downloading the software intentionally. Fortunately, it lacks the ability to auto-update or unfortunately, it lacks the ability to auto-update. So it cannot get the security update, but it couldn't also get the bad update and automatically either, which is great. But this is not the only software that can be compromised in this sense. Many of the pieces of software that are running within our computers are getting updates or are getting information, newer versions and so on from party which we trust, implicitly trust. And the question is, how many of these trusted parties are having software in our computers? There was a case with Lenovo doing updates in not that safe way. Dell was doing something similar. Many others were doing things that might not be the best from security point of view. But many of these softwares are running with very high privileges, so perhaps being careful about who you trust is a good idea. Now, do you recognize the picture up there? I'm calling it picture because it's not a picture, it's a, uh, two Japanese characters. And it actually is something called Mirai. Those who are recognizing the name might be recognizing it as the piece of malicious code that was running over home routers and other devices using a bunch of passwords. Why am I mentioning this in context of ransomware? Well, because there are more than enough such devices all around the world. This is not graph of Mirai. This is coming from, I think, five years ago when there were a couple hundred thousand such devices that could be compromised using four different usernames and passwords. Mirai was using about 50 of them. But if you have control over such device, we call it smart device. You know, when I looked it up in the, in the dictionary, it looked roughly like this. You can use it for many different purposes. If it is a network area storage, which you use for keeping all your files and backups, it is great, it can be encrypted. Or it can be encrypted and first exfiltrated so that someone, even if you happen to be able to recover the files, they might still contain pictures you might not want to be completely public. So they can demand the ransom for not publishing the information. You can use these compromised home devices to prevent some services from working and demand ransom not from the poor user who is behind this device, behind the home router, but rather demand it from the service he's trying to access. For example, you have a bank. And if you have control over their clients' internet connections, the internet banking might be working very poorly, it might be breaking, it might not uh, work properly, it might stop working completely between, uh, I don't know, 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. And who will be the people complaining about? They will not complain about their home router being infected because they don't know. They will complain about the bank having very poor website the bank will not be able to do anything about it because its website is working perfectly. It can be bank, it can be shop, it can be casino, it can be emergency services. Any of these things can be very good victims of ransomware by targeting their users to prevent them from accessing it. The usual kind of denial of service, but not at the end, but rather at the source. Now, I was talking about crypto, and actually my uh, description of this talk was about cryptography, and I haven't mentioned that much of a crypto, apart from it is the fact that crypto is hard. Doing a good crypto is hard. The bad news is that even bad crypto can be good enough. 
we know that MD5 is bad, SHA1 is bad, this is bad, that is bad, there was heart bleed, there was uh, whatever other cloud bleed, this thing, that thing. Basically, if you try to do crypto right, you cannot go by the textbook, you need to learn a lot of many of the attacks that were discovered to avoid them and so on. Doing crypto right is difficult. But that does not mean that the crypto, even if you implement it poorly, can not be bad enough. Because the usual idea of a person is like, okay, if I know how to encrypt it, I surely will know how to decrypt it. Because we are liking, as humans, we like analogy. We try to understand things in terms of analogy, because there is there something that I know from physical world, I might be able to map it to the virtual one. For example, if something deleted all my files, I lost them, I don't have them anymore, which is similar situation if my house burned down, it is gone, there is nothing left, done. If my data got exfiltrated, it is similar to like some spy coming to the company and going through the drawers and taking a picture of everything or copying it. That's understandable. But your files being encrypted but still with you does not have a direct analogy in the real world. Like you have something, but you can't really access it. There is something wrong with it. Like I almost have it, but I can't do much with it. And the intuition is, if you could encrypt it and you know how the encryption works, you should be able to decrypt it, like you just work backwards, right? Well, one of the analogies that I found to be working pretty well is this one. If I give you the properly organized Rubik's Cube and then I mix it, it was very easy. And then I ask you to put it back to the original state, you might find it hard. Yes. It can be done. It can be actually done without any thinking. It can be done purely mechanically by trying all the possibilities, except trying all the possibilities would take very long. There are more efficient algorithms for doing it, but finding them takes long enough if you have never tried it. Of course, if you are familiar with it, it is actually very easy. But this is similar to the situation with crypto. People do get better understanding if you show them a problem that is easy to do in one direction and more difficult to do in the other direction, but it's not a math problem. As long as it is mathematics, they tend to get scared and not understand. If I explain that SHA1 is poor hash function because there is a bad, uh, like you can create two files with the same SHA1 hash, it's like, so what? Or if I tell them that yes, RC4 has this bad statistical bias in second byte, what? But if I show them, okay, build the cube, or rather like put it into the original state, it's like, ah, this is why it is difficult. So far, showing the analogy has worked. I don't have one for the encryption itself, as I mentioned, with how to explain in an easy way why the files, when they are encrypted, you cannot access them. On one hand, people might be actually happy about this, because after all, with the GDPR uh, properly kicking into place next year, if your files are encrypted, you can be sure that even if they leak, they will not be, you will not be liable for leak of any useful information. It is actually sometimes quite nice. Sometimes you get infected by two pieces of ransomware. One of them encrypts your files. The second one sees, ah, wait, I have not encrypted these ones yet. So it encrypts them. Then the first one sees, ah, I have not encrypted these files yet. Repeat, repeat, repeat. You will have a very secure bunch of files you will not be able to pay enough to actually retrieve them back because usually even the first one will screw up enough. But it is something that actually is the good use of encryption versus the bad use of encryption. And unfortunately, for good use, we have to do get the crypto right. For the bad one, they don't really need to. Thank you very much. Are you scared now?